Welcome to the Gridiron Stud Show. Chad Wilson and Emil Calamino as we are here every week. I'm on camera. Emil's still not on camera yet, but he's going to get there at some point. Anyway, for our podcast listening audience, it doesn't matter who's on camera. We are here and you will hear our voice for the next 60 minutes as we talk NFL and college football. We are to the end of college football. Emil, how quickly did that happen? That happened super. It fast. goes by quickly. And part of it is, as we always talk about this, you know, and we're not going to be in this situation in a year and a half. We'll talk about that. Um, it ends early December. Then you have to wait and you get a lot of these bowl games that at this point in time, other than a few big ones, we don't care about most yes. of them. And then we get yes. the, the two playoff games. Now in 2024, that's all going to change. It is. Um, and I don't know if we'll even get to that today. Hopefully yeah. we'll have a chance to. But um, we are uh, going to jump into some topics here on the Gridiron Stud Show um, with the NFL and college football. And before we do that, though, as always, if you're listening to us, on, if you're listening to the podcast, go ahead and subscribe right now on whatever platform you're listening to us on, whether that's Spotify, Apple Podcast or um, Anchor, whatever you're listening on, go ahead and hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Hate for you to miss out on the next great show because we're cranking them out each and every week. Of course, if you're watching me on YouTube, go ahead and hit the subscribe button there because I do a lot of things on this YouTube channel and I'm sure you would all enjoy it. I don't care how you go about consuming the game of football. You're going to love this YouTube channel. So go ahead and hit the subscribe button there if that's where you happen to be taking in the show right now. If you want to follow us on social media, you can follow Emil on Facebook, E-M-I-L-C-A-L-O-M-I-N-O, just as it sounds. Go find him there. He He's in there every day. Emil, have you missed a day of posting? No. That's 30. No. I'll talk to you about anything. What do you want to That's talk about? Yeah, whatever it, whatever as long, it is. As, as, as long as we're having a conversation, I won't get in the cesspool with anybody. I don't do that anymore. Well, what you fun is me? that? That's social media. I mean, like, come no, on. No, you you don't even do that. You used to be better at that. And now I never want to better at it. So you, you, yeah, you used to do it all the time. Now you you kind of like, you pick your fights. You pick I, your spot. I kind of found better things to do a little bit. Wait, guys. wait, wait. Before we, I don't want to, we did not plug my friend here. His ebook is out. Absolutely. Talk um, about it. I, I finally broke down and wrote a book. Um, on defensive back play, you know, 25 years, Emil, of playing, coaching, training DBs. Um, you start to repeat things over and over and over. And so I figured, man, let me get all this stuff down on paper, so to speak, even though it is an ebook. That's the world we're living in right now. But decided to get it down on, on wax, as they say in the hood, you know, back in the day when you're... <laughs> Dropping your well, rhyme. this guy won't say it, but if anybody listening, if you don't know him and you're not from South Florida, he trains many, many defensive backs, some many of which play in the NFL. So if you are in the coaching profession or you play, it's certainly something worth a couple dollars invested. Yeah, uh, I, absolutely. I appreciate you bringing that up. But yes, 101 DB Tips is the name of the book. Um, jump on Shopify right now. Matter of fact, I think I'll put a link in the description to the show. Um, we'll go ahead and have my ebook be one of the sponsors of the show. But definitely, if you're a defensive back, if you play it, if you've got a son that plays it, if you coach it, you definitely want to get a hold of this book. Everyone should have this book if they're involved with DB play. So 101 DB tips, you can find it on Shopify. Even if you searched on Google, it should take you there right now. 101 DB tips. Also, uh, it's that time of year, bowl games, NBA, NFL, World Cup, all going. And there's odds for it all at one of our sponsors, Bovada Sportsbook here. Long-standing online sportsbook. And that should mean something that means there's integrity there. Not that that's even an issue anymore, Emil. I remember when online sportsbooks first came out, there was always the worry that they would take your money and pack up and run or get closed down. Not a, an issue anymore. But there is, like any business, Good customer service, bad customer service, well-run business, not so well-run business. Bavada is a well-run sports book and definitely somewhere that uh, you would want to go throw a little something down on the game. Yeah, or a little bit. action on the games. That's the right. Bowl season's coming up. This guy will pass out some bowl winners for you. He, own, yeah, he owns the bowls. 
you're inclined to get down on the action, Bovada Sportsbook, I definitely will uh, have a link to that in the description. So go ahead and check them out. Amal, I gotta, I'm going to ask you a little personal question here. When's the last time you and Denise got in an argument? I've been married, uh, God, in a couple of week, in a couple in a week. I've been married twenty nine years, so <laughs> probably about mm, two weeks ago, but not a bad argument. Yeah, maybe about a week ago for me. I think the next yeah. time, Abel, I get in an argument with Carmen, my lovely wife, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna jump. Should I jump in a transfer portal? Uh, well. You can't do that in our game, but in college you can. <laughs> Good God, Emil. It just, it's left and right. And, uh, you know, so it's my world. I get it. Um, whatever's on your Twitter timeline, you tend to feel like that's the entire world. But good grief. Every time I turn around, someone else is jumping into transfer portal. And you know what, Emil? I'm, I'm kind of getting it. I understand it's a different world than the one that I grew up in, the one that I played football in. So I, I get it. Guys need to transfer. You only have a limited amount of time. Uh, under which you can try and display your talent and take a shot at the NFL. But by golly, man, not everyone going into this transfer portal should be in it. I just. Well, no, but I don't know where we're going. We've covered that for a long time, uh, but I do think fans, including ourselves, and we're, we're, we seem to be doing better with it, need to acclimate to the fact that it's a, a new world. That's part of recruiting. You're gonna you're gonna probably get anywhere from eight to fourteen players every year on your team through the portal, and you're probably gonna lose a similar amount out of the portal. It's gonna be an in and out for almost every big program now. Yeah, uh, that just really seems to be the deal. And you know, uh, maybe we'll get to it when we get around to our college segment. But uh, it's just crazy to see day after day, guy after guy jumping into the portal and you just know some guys are going to get left in there and they're going to get a raw deal. And I just, well, they're going to get left in there. Or they're just going to go someplace else and end up in the same position because eventually at some point you got to be, I understand sometimes a kid gets in a bad situation and he needs to leave that, but that should be more, I think not the rule it should be the exception. Now it's just, if I'm not playing enough, I'm going to leave. Well, at some point you're going to have to compete with somebody. And if you're at a top program, they're bringing in a guy to compete with you every year. So it yeah, uh, yeah, and then, I mean, at some point you're going to meet some adversity, and then what are you going to do? And once you start that whole streak of taking off when things get hot, at some point you're going to come up snake eyes. But again, this is one of those things we're just going to have to watch. Anyway, NFL is what we're on right now. Emily, we've got some questions that we need to ask when it comes to NFL football. The, one of the biggest things, if not the biggest thing talked about last week was what was going on with the New York Jets. Abruptly, Zach Wilson removed from his position as the starting quarterback, and it had as much ammo as to what he did off the field as what he did on the field. And that was he was just very poor in the interview afterwards, and he seemed to really frustrate his teammates. So um Coach Sala decided to have him sit and watch for a while, and let's put the veteran backup in, which was Mike White, someone you're familiar with. He was started off in the Cowboys organization, did a fine job there, you know, obviously not in a position to be a starter there with Dak Prescott being the quarterback. But, Emil, after watching what Mike White did last week, and I believe he came up with a quarterback rating of 149. I mean, that's almost like a perfect SAT score. Oh, it is. Should Mike White – be the starter for the rest of the season for the New York Jets. I don't think there's a question. I mean, unless he had an absolute streak of flaming out where, you know, maybe two two games where he was one touchdown, four interceptions or something crazy. I, I don't see how you can go back to, to Wilson at this point. Uh, what do you do, though, if you're the Jets? You drafted this guy. He's your he's you well, drafted they, to be they a, did a Jets thing, right? The Jets do Jets things even when they're doing good. I mean, they, they went out and they used a high draft pick on a kid that's extremely immature. And I'm surprised in all their interview processes, processes, <laughs> as they say, that they did not uncover with the amount of questions they ask these players, especially quarterbacks, that this kid is very mature. I mean, and they may have uncovered it, Emil, and decided that they wanted to overlook it. It's just, well, why are you asking the questions then? But that had to have come up. Um, they had to have learned something of this in their whole interview process. But you, but Chad, just the fact that he's in New York, and I know people will point to 
you know, people who remember, they'll point to Joe Namath and all that. His his off the field antics in a city like New York are going to be a problem. <laughs> you know, it's tough to know because what will work in in New York City will be an eccentric, if I can use that word, off the beaten path a little bit. Will that excite the media who is always hungry for a story and content? Or do you just need an ultra buttoned up guy? And that might be boring to the New York media and they may drudge. Some. It's just well, hard. I'm not to there to entertain the media. I think for your leader, you know, I, to me, the gold standard of New York sports, as far as a leader goes and how he conducted himself was Jeter. Yeah. Um, because. You can only be one of those though. Of course, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying everybody's going to be him, but he had his, his parties and his fun. But when you watch the documentary on him, he knew how to do it. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> he, he definitely did. I mean, yes, if, he, you know, he I wrote a book. Him. If anyone should put a book out, it's that guy. Yes. And I mean, Wilson, Zach Wilson is immature, not accepting responsibility at a position that, you know, you're the leader of, of the team, whether you like it or not. If your quarterback is, is giving out that vibe, it's going to be bad. You're going to lose the locker room. Now you got a guy who comes in, throws for whatever, 315 yards or whatever it was, wins a game, looks good. That locker room is 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 at best divided, probably tilted way toward Mike White. Yeah. So I don't see how if you're the Jets sitting at seven and four with a legitimate chance to make the playoffs, which is a big deal for this organization, how you can go back to Zach Wilson. Yeah. And obviously for those listening out there who may not know, uh, I obviously uh, know Mike White, Mike White. I was a coach on the coaching staff where Mike White was the quarterback in high school. We won a state championship, the only state championship won at university school in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He was the quarterback. I was a defensive coordinator uh, and knew the kid before he came to high school. So, um, you know, obviously I'm going to have some bias there. I am a person who likes to wait three weeks on anything, a coaching change in the middle of the season, a new player being put in like a quarterback. I like to wait and see three weeks and then we'll really know what's happening there. Well, there's going to be, I mean, I know there's some film on Mike White, but now when you get him playing two and three successive games, defensive coaches are going to have a chance to break it down week to week successively in this same system. Sure. And, you know, then you start to see the flaws and that that's, right. You and know, a much tougher game this week, too, by the way, taking on the Minnesota Vikings than, than the Bears. On the road, it's very loud there, as you know. That that stadium is, it, you know, they get it rocking. And if the Vikings get off to a hot start, you're going to face some adversity in that game. And you're we're going to see how he handles that. Sure. Because, you know, playing offense, as you know, the noise is is really a problem on in, in that, that type of venue. There, Seattle. So. Yeah, so – but I do I I do agree with you on this particular question, Emil, because if for if nothing else, it's going to be difficult to put a Zach Wilson back in um, after several performances by Mike White. They're not all going to be what they were last Sunday, but they're going to be solid performances. They're going to be veteran type performances for a team that thinks they have a chance. And, you know, if they continue to be anywhere close to this and they're they're winning games by and large, going to be tough to throw Zach Wilson back into that situation. Oh, yeah. listen, if he plays like that again, they're going to have to put forget a red jersey in practice. They're going to have to put one of those, uh, you know, the pen dot the, the where they wear the neon, the neon shirts on the highway so you can see them because. Some of those defensive guys are going to want to light him up. I'm telling you, if he puts it, if he gets out there and does what he did the last time he played, I mean, I think he threw for 76 yards. Going to be tough, man. And I, I do kind of see Zach Wilson going the way of Baker Mayfield and playing a defensive end in practice uh, in a few weeks here. <laughs> Things continue the way that they go. So I got one for you. Let's move on to a, a one that I have here for you. Jeff Saturday, very good lineman. Should he be the Colts coach? <laughs> Emil, um, moving forward, speaks, I don't mean he's going to coach the rest of the year. I mean, should he be considered? I wouldn't even. Time? I would. I wouldn't even guarantee that with uh, with Jim Ursay. But uh, I will say this: this speaks to what I just said in our last question. I like to wait three weeks. You know, he came in that first week. Team was energized. Things were at a you know at a fever pitch. They beat the Raiders. 
Yes. And uh, everyone was like, well, look at that. Mm -hmm. This is our guy. And then, you know, we've had a couple performances after that. And then this week, um, time management problems at the end of the game, which, you know what, I'm I'm at this point, Emil, it must really be something totally different when you're actually in the game coaching it. And you're talking to someone who's coached, albeit on the high school level, there must be something about coaching in an NFL game that really makes guys' minds go soft in that final two minutes because so many guys mismanage it. So did Jeff Saturday, uh, the entirety of his post-game press conference in the week um, after that has been answering the whole questions about why he didn't take a timeout and give his team more time at the end of the game. Jeff Saturday himself, they pulled up some tweets from Jeff Saturday because, as you know, before he was the head coach. He was an analyst. He was an analyst, very opinionated, and um, there were some where he was questioning coaches and their end of the game um, two-minute handling of situations. And there he was in that situation, a guy who's played and even coached himself, albeit again at the high school level, and he's fumbling it around. Listen, we could spend it, and I, we won't go off this tangent here today. But Answer your question, though, Emil. You can finish out the year. I think the co I think the Colts would do well to find a an experienced coach to hold that position. A professional football coach is what you're saying. Someone, yeah, someone who yes. spent some time in there. Don't just grab um, the prof. You know, the well, I got to tell you, the matchup on paper they're playing my boys this week doesn't look good for them. I mean, they don't protect the quarterback. Matt Ryan is basically anchored in stone at this point in his career, and <laughs> Dallas gets after. Well, the excuse me, you did not see Matt Ryan and his thirty-nine yard dash a couple of weeks ago. You're, I, I did see it, uh, but again, he moves. He moves slightly better than I do at this point. It did take 30 minutes to cover that 39 yes. yards, but he covered it. Yes. What do you got? What, what what else are we talking about here in the NFL? Big matchup this week for this team, by the way. The Miami Dolphins heading out to take on the San Francisco 49ers. Um, and, you know, McDaniel returning to the 49ers. But, Emil, based on what we're seeing right now, do you think the Miami Dolphins will win the AFC East? Based on how the two teams at the top of that division are playing right now, I think the Dolphins are playing better football. Mm -hmm. The question becomes, obviously, right, what happens this week? Because this is a big matchup on the road in San Francisco. And then I don't know what week, but I know it's coming up. And the weather's turned up there. We saw they got six feet of snow. The mm -hmm. Dolphins have to go to Buffalo, where – historically even back to the Dan Marino era they never played well in Buffalo that was never a place that they they excelled so if you ask me who do I think is playing better football the Dolphins I, I just don't know if they I, I wish you asked me this next week let me let me see the game Sunday this Sunday I think I'm going to learn a lot about the Miami Dolphins well, the funny thing is, we are recording this podcast on Thursday evening. This is right before a big matchup that, you know, applies to this question because it's the Bills taking on the Patriots. And so I feel pretty certain that if the Patriots were to beat the Bills in this game that's coming up after our recording here, you would probably have a, a stronger answer to what's Oh, if, if I saw that and you asked me this on Friday and I said, oh, the Patriots, then I'd say, that I think the Dolphins right now, there's no way around it, are playing some phenomenal football. I mean, and, so, and I, I mean, Emil, the right now you can make the argument that the 49ers right at this moment might be the best team short of the Chiefs in the NFL. So do the Dolphins losing to the 49ers really diminish your uh, thoughts of the Dolphins and how they and their strength of their team if they lose to the 49ers this weekend? Depends how they lose, right? I mean, everybody loses games in the NFL, so that doesn't bother me. Uh, it just, you know, if they go out there and they, they play a very competitive game and lose, it doesn't diminish any at, at all how I think about them. Now, if they go out there and for some strange reason get absolutely torched, then I might start to question them a little bit because they're going to play a physical team. And I want to know, are the Dolphins able to stay in there with them? Is, is really, that fair? Evan, yeah, fair. Uh, I really haven't analyzed the end of the season schedules for both of these teams, but looking at it here on top of the game that the bills are, would have played already by the time folks hear this, they do have the jets, the dolphins, 
at Chicago, at Cincinnati, New England. So that's a, it's a bit of a tough schedule. The Dolphins. Is that the Dolphins that, schedule? No, that's the that's what the Bills have laid. Oh on. yeah, but the Dolphins now are are embarking on three straight road games at San Francisco, at the Chargers, at the Bills, home with Green Bay, at New England, home with the Jets. So I mean, they both have difficult schedules on paper. Probably um, even they're probably even in terms of. Um, listen, let me put it this way: Do I? I think there's three teams in the. I think there's six teams. If you force me now that are built to win a Super Bowl this year. In the in the AFC, the Chiefs, Dolphins, Bills, in no specific order. In the NFC, the 49ers, Eagles, and Cowboys. I think they're the six teams that are... Leaving Minnesota out of this. Interesting. Oh, yeah, I don't think... Uh, Minnesota, I just... I think Minnesota's a nice story. They have nine wins. Like I said, seven or eight of them are by one score. They play very good situational football. It's the Kirk Cousins thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's me, though. That doesn't mean I'm right. I, that's, I see six teams that I think are built to potentially get through the playoffs. Fair enough. All right. I don't know if we got a definitive answer on this. But I'm going to go. an answer, yes, the Dolphins are going to win. Yeah, the I'm going to go strong with the yeah, Dolphins. They're going to the win, win the East. I don't like the kind of football the Bills are playing. And, you know, at the risk of sounding like a complete idiot, because, again, this will be uh, released after the game tonight, there's a strong possibility the Bills could lose to the Patriots. They so. could, and Josh Allen, he's turning the ball over too much, and that's not what he did. Yeah, he's operating time. outside of the offense for whatever reason. Is That is an overbelief in all of what is was said about him or if defenses have adjusted and now he feels he needs to do something above and beyond to, you know, make things work on that side of the ball. Let me ask you this. Here's one for you. Russell Wilson. Now, not if, not if, not not whether they can or not, cannot do this, but would you get rid of Russell Wilson if you were if, done? If, in a perfect world. In a perfect can, world where I wouldn't be completely and totally destroyed. Yes. Cat-wise. Yes. I would not. Okay. Yeah, I would not. And that's a shocking answer from that to keep but... his wife around. No, <laughs> we could still <laughs> see her if we wanted to. Um, no, it has nothing to do with Sierra, <laughs> the lovely Sierra. I think it has to do with what I've always known. And it's not Russell Wilson's fault that everyone wanted to put the Denver Broncos on this, on this strange uh, top of the mountain, simply because they got this player that was good in Seattle. People really just need to understand that there is an adjustment when you switch teams like that. It is made even worse when all of these expectations are put out there, which is what people did. They put the Denver Broncos deep into the playoffs. Some put them in the Super Bowl simply because Russell Wilson was coming there. So he's a victim of expectations and of just being in a totally new system. That means new players, new locker room, new attitude, new town, and a new coach who is new to coaching. Um, I haven't had a chance to make a deep dive into this thing, but it seems to me just on the fringe of what I've watched is that the head coach is in over his head. Is Russell Wilson playing well? I obviously not. Um, are there some things missing that maybe I've seen him do in Seattle, regardless of the system? Yes. Um, and most notably the deep ball. But if you're talking about if I would get rid of the guy, no, I would keep He's done enough in this league to get more of a chance than just one year. Well, you know, we talk a lot of sports. So I don't know if you recall our, when we talked about this in him in the preseason, the one concern I had potentially with him was I saw some slippage at the end of his time in Seattle, mm -hmm. probably in large part to the fact that he got beat like a pinata at a six-year-old's you know birthday party. Okay, they hit him. And you can only take so many of those. You know, I mean, Cam Newton's a massive man. Mm -hmm. And the the beatings that he took in Carolina shortened his effectiveness in the NFL. I mean, there's a guy who, what, 6'5", 250? And that's oh. not Russell Wilson. So I think there was unrealistic expectations put on him. And then he has a good agent. And the market is what it is. And now he's got this $240 million contract. Well, that's not his fault. Yeah, that's pressure too. Um, yes, he loves the money. He's set for life. Sure, but that's not his fault that somebody wanted to give him two hundred forty million dollars. That's the market. That's his agent. But I think the fans expect a quarterback 
that's that guy. And I'm not sure. I think he can still be an effective NFL quarterback, but I don't think he's ever going to be the guy that he was seven years ago in Seattle. Yeah, I don't off the top of my head, can't really think of a quarterback who switched places and was immediately effective and met everyone's lofty expectations. Joe Montana. I mean, even that, Amol. He took the um, Chiefs to the AFC Championship. He he did, but you and I both know he was not the Montana in San Francisco. No, and that's my point, though. I think Wilson can be effective in the right system with some surrounded with some offensive talent and, and with the right coach. I just don't think he's ever going to be his Russell Wilson early in his career. That doesn't mean you can't get to the Super Bowl with him, but he could carry Seattle when he was younger. I don't think he's going to carry a team now is all I'm saying. One thing I will say uh, about Russ um, is that it seems that he wants to run some type of an offensive system that I don't think is in his best interest, uh, which is him just throwing the ball around and trying to rack up a bunch of yards and, and move into the offensive categories of, um, you know, an Aaron Rodgers, a Tom Brady and a Drew Brees, that type of thing. I think he's envisioned himself as that type of player when in fact it really is, he's at his best in something more run based like Pete Carroll wanted to have. And then we do play action off of that something more along the lines of what Tua is running in in Miami. And so the whole yeah, he uses him, mobility as an advantage to get him out, you know, on roll outs and boot legs yeah. outside the pocket where he can, you know, where he's not looking over huge linemen trying to make throws, where he sure. has clearer vision down the field. And and now you have to respect him to maybe he takes off and gets eight, nine yards on you. Yes, I am think he is he's going to be better off in an execution based type offense. And that is going to be something where they are play fakes, they're reverses, there's, you know what I mean, there's movement yeah. by a quarterback and like you said mobility is used, but the mobility is used to get him more clear and defined throws in the in what it is he's trying to run and what I think they're trying to do in Denver his mobility means he needs to run for yards and first downs and and beat guys to a spot and get hit and he said that's just not going to be him i don't think in his prime that would have been best for him in his prime i don't think in anybody's prime i'll be honest with you i still tell and i tell you this every time it comes up in a conversation i don't like quarterback i don't mind a guy running three or four times a game to keep the defense honest getting out of bounds getting down not trying to run for 40 yards but just keeping the defense honest but when you start showing me quarterbacks that want to run 15 times a game by design in this league, it'll work for a while until they're hurt. It has an expiration date. Sure, it has it an expiration. Lamar it Jackson Michael and Vick Jalen and Hurts are both doing that right now. They're running. They'll have their time. Yeah. They have their, yeah. You get older. You know what I mean? Father time, as they say, is undefeated. All right. That's it for our NFL segment. I thought there were some pretty interesting questions out there that we needed to ask. You know, I would love it if our fans would get into that. You know, each and every week, it'd be nice if you guys submitted some questions, maybe that you need to ask some things, maybe that we missed or something that's just really on the mind of the fans out there. And if you do have it, you can feel free to send those questions to me at any time during the week. You can send it to C. Wilson at gridironstuds.com. Or if you're an anchor user, that's how you're listening to the show right now. You can leave a voice message. Um, asking some questions there. And if you're part of the YouTube audience, real easy, drop that in the comments. You could even come back during, you can come back to last week's show and ask questions for next week in the comments section of YouTube. So just a really good chance for our listening and viewing. Well, aren't we fancy? Yeah, you know, we got to make use of all of this technology is out there. So there are ways to get to us, use them, um, and we can make this thing a little bit more interactive. But as we always do on this show, we got picks to make. Emil, wasn't a great NFL week for us, but you know what? We're still up. It was 500. You lost a little vig, as they say. But, uh, you know, in the NFL, Chad was one and two last week. I was two and one. So we were three and three overall. Our uh, record on the season is identical. We're both 23-12 with a push. So for you folks out there, uh, Bovada might not want to sponsor us much longer. Okay. Hey, what can I what can I say? Recap the picks for us. Well, you had uh, a winner with the Cincinnati Bengals. That was your Thank God your... for those guys. I really should have been three and zero. Oh. 
to be honest. Yeah, I know. We you had some tough losses. I don't understand what Baltimore did. But. No, I, I don't know what they did either. Baltimore just totally, they coughed that game up against the Jags. I mean, they just handed, that was one that they just handed it away. You were given four, you were in position to win the game. I thought they'd be up by more than that even, but they, hey, give Trevor Lawrence some credit. He made a good, he made some good throws on that drive. He really did. But that's, Baltimore can't lose that game. And they did. And then you had the Seahawks who, somehow managed to lose to the Raiders and allow uh, Jacobs to basically end up in the NFL L Hall of Fame after one game. I mean, he, I mean, how many yards did he run for? 400? I mean, a ton. I mean, aided by 80, 80, what was it? 84, 86 yard run at the end of the game. That always helps your average and your overall total. But um, I w- this, this game was being covered late in the game. It was. And, no, Seattle caught that up. So yeah, you were one and two. And then me... I laid a ton of points last week in the early game. got away with it, too. I'll be damned. The Dolphins were up 30 to nothing, and they decided to fall asleep at the switch. And uh, they made that interesting, but they they beat Houston 30 to 15. That was a win. I gave 15 and a half with the Chiefs. They struggled, but that's how bad the Rams are right now. The Rams playing with a third-string quarterback actually played kind of well and lost 26-10. So I won that Hard game. to believe that's our defending Super Bowl champions at work there, but it is. They hey, they didn't care about the picks. Well, they got their, their trophies going to be there and their flag, but they might not enjoy the next few years. And then finally, uh, I took a half-point loss with the Packers. I thought they'd play tough. They lost Aaron Rodgers. Uh, backup came in and did a good job, but they lost by seven to the Eagles, 40-33. to 33. I was getting six and a half. That's an L, so... We were three and three overall between the two of us. There you go. All right. So um, I guess you can continue to go first this week. We could do that. I'll go first this week. I'll like when we're playing golf, I'm further away. I'll, I'll putt first. Let's go to a big, who thought this would be a big game at the beginning of the year, but the NFC East is back to the days of when Chad and I were young. All the teams are good right now. They'd all be in the playoffs. And we have the Commanders going to New York to play the Giants. Uh, very disrespectful line, in my opinion. I know the Commanders are playing good football. They're seven and five. They've been on a roll. The Giants, though, are seven and four, and they're at home. I know they've had some losses, but guess what? They're on ten days. They got a mini buy after losing Thanksgiving to my Cowboys. They're catching two and a half points at home. I'm on the Giants here. I see no reason to take the commanders in this game, in this spot, you're asking something that they're not used to. They're used to being an underdog in this spot. Now you're asking them to go out there as a favorite. If the Giants lose this game, their season may unravel because it, they should be pissed <laughs> coming no into question. this game. No question, no question about it. So give me the Giants in this one. Another big game this week. There's a lot, you know, it's funny. I was going to tell you this. Do you notice last weekend, the NFL games essentially stunk? I mean, we had three of them on Thanksgiving, so Sunday was a light day. Uh, and and the college games, I felt, were great last week. I think it's the opposite this week. Yeah, uh, championship week in college football, though, you know, I'm happy to see it. It's not the most exciting one. I've not seen. the matchups we got, generally speaking. But anyway, back to this second game, we have the Tennessee Titans, always a formidable opponent, at least – when Derrick Henry's been there, they're getting four and a half at the Eagles. I like the Titans here. I, I They're coming off. I think their strength plays to what right now is an Eagle weakness. And one thing, anybody who's been following the Eagles, they're 10 and one, no doubt about it. They've played some good football generally this year, but you can run on the Eagles. And they haven't really fixed that. They've tried to bring in some big bodies. Sue, they brought in uh, Lindell Joseph, but still, Teams are having success on the ground against the Eagles. And if you're if you're playing that team, that's the formula. The Eagles have been built offensively. Keep their offense on the sidelines, run the football. Four and a half points. I don't know if the Titans win the game, but I think this is a three-point game. This game feels like probably one of the better games of the weekend to me. Give me the Titans plus four and a half. I would agree. I think it's going to come down to a soccer cleat. Yep, yep. And then finally, you know, I know what you said, and I I hear you. I like the 49ers. I mean, they were a threat last year. People forget the Rams won the Super Bowl by by kicking a field goal to beat them. And really, the 49ers beat the Rams two out of three games. And the game, like I just said, the game they lost 
was by a field goal for the NFC Championship. You know what? There's something about what the Dolphins are doing that I want three and a half in this game. I I just kind of like the way they're playing. I don't know if they win again. This might be another one that comes down to a cleat, but I think they're going to move the ball a little bit. I think the 49ers are by design a conservative offensive football team. So unless you kick it around and give them short fields, they're probably not going to put up a ton of points. So I I just feel like this could be like a 23-20 type of game. Somebody kicks it at the end and three and a half, that hook is big to me. I'll take the Dolphins plus three and a half. Yeah, um, I agree with that also. And another interesting part of this is I think it was two years ago that these two teams faced each other on the staff of the 49ers was the current Miami Dolphins head coach, uh, Mike McDaniel. And, you know, the Dolphins run a very unique defense in the league, uh, which involves all out pressure. They play more zero man pressure than anyone else. And for our, you know, novice fans out there is where there is no safety help and you send the maximum amount of players at the quarterback. Basically you're sending one more player than the team can block and it can be troublesome. And I really think the dolphins may have a bit of an advantage here because McDaniel knows exactly what hurts the offense that the San Francisco 49ers are running. And he has a team that's capable of doing it. Yeah, that and that's a great hurt. point. Cause in those coverages, a couple things, right? <clears throat> Your quarterback has to be good against the blitz. You need some receivers that can win off the line of scrimmage. Now, if that stuff happens, there's there's some big plays to be made. And then the other thing is, you know, there's some big runs if you got a quarterback that can tuck it and run. But that's not really Garoppolo's game. No, no, it's distributing the ball. And 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 these guys aren't really big separation guys in terms of the receivers. They are really good after the catch. So it's going to be interesting to see that. You know, one team I hope would be watching this game and playing very close attention to it. It would be the Arizona Cardinals because they have a similar type quarterback as the Miami Dolphins, more athletic and a stronger arm, but watching that offense operate against that defense that's in your division that you're going to have to deal with for the, you know, the obviously foreseeable future. I would hope that the Arizona Cardinals would pay very close attention to that. Obviously not good point. Gonna... It's a good point. Yeah, what do you got attention. first? I mean, I, I can't be the only one giving out winners today. I am going to start with where we agree, and that is with the New York Giants. I'm with you on that. Giants are coming off of a loss to the Dallas Cowboys on Turkey Day. And, Amal, I don't know the last time that I've seen a situation where a team is going to play four division games in a row, but that is the case for the New York Giants. It's Dallas last week. It's Washington this week. It's Philadelphia the next week, and then you've got – uh, Washington again. This Washington game's at home, Amo. They absolutely have to win it. Uh, this no, I really believe that. I mean, you you know, I feel this is, in a way, I know there's a lot of football still to be played, but I feel this is their season. I think if they lay an egg here, it's going to be. It's a fork in the road. It's yeah. a fork in the road for yeah. them. You can't lose Dallas, then lose the Washington. Um, and then on the flip side, yes, Washington has been winning lately, but Amo, they've been kind of feasting on the also rans of the league and i'm going to cut out the philadelphia game where they shocked them other yes. than that amel it's they beat chicago and green bay two teams struggling indianapolis another team struggling with a with the coach that they ripped off of the uh the booth there yeah, they took a loss versus the vikings then they upset the eagles the texans stink and the falcons, Man, are the falcons. They, you know it's yeah. not a whole bunch of wins against guys that have been winning so to put them now as favorites in this situation, I don't like it, so I'm with you. I like the New York Giants. Uh, the Detroit Lions, I believe the game is at a pick em. You can you can it's One point right now. Lions are one-point chalk. The Lions are a one-point favorite. Um, they're, all, they're at home off of a loss, Amol. This is the scrappiest team in the league. The loss last week ended a three-game win streak. I think they get right back on it. I've been impressed by them uh, over the – it, well, listen. Since dating back to last year, I've been impressed with the way that they fight. Their I team. agree with you. I think they're. I think they're a sneaky good team, and that yeah, sounds. That's a live home dog against a Jacksonville yeah. team giddy off of a win. Absolutely giddy off of a win, and costing me a point spread winner last week. Um, I don't know what state of mind. That this isn't in. a revenge pick, is it? No, it is not a revenge pick. The Lions are at home laying a small number against a team that's four and seven. That's what it just really boils down to. There, so I'm going to take the Lions. I like that pick. Finally, Emil, uh, you know, I love to find the games with some hoopla around it and where the 
Um, odds makers try to take liberties and throw a little bit more cheese on the pizza that they need to. Yes, Deshaun Watson is coming back. We know Deshaun Watson is a good quarterback. Deshaun Watson has not played quarterback for almost two years. <laughs> almost two years. Yeah. Um, when last we saw Deshaun, it didn't look good in the preseason for them. So he's jumping back in there. And at the end of the day, Emil, this is a four and seven football team that's laying a touchdown on the road. Why are they doing that? I don't know, because you know what? As much as we can make fun of the Texans for falling behind 30 nothing last week, I'll give them credit. They kept playing. I mean, you know, if they were going to quit, that score against the Dolphins ends up like 47-7. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's all you need to see. Because had they laid down, like you said, I would want nothing to do with them. I would feel like they're in, they're in rider truck status, and I wouldn't mess with a team like that. But what they did in the second half of that game gave me all the confidence in the world for me to take them at home because you know they were going to be motivated anyway with their former quarterback coming to town. And I just don't see how you make a four and seven football team with a quarterback that hasn't played in almost two years, a seven point favorite. That is just the odds makers trying to take advantage of the situation. I'm not going to fall prey to it. Give me the Houston Texans to um, they're probably win this game. Emil, to be honest. Wow. With, Let with me pack. recap yours. Chad's giving you the giants plus two and a half, the lions minus one at home. The Texans getting a whole touchdown at home against the Browns. I'm giving you the Giants plus two and a half, giving you the Titans plus four and a half on the road in Philly, and the Dolphins plus three and a half on the road in San Francisco. And that's it. That is uh we're we're going with this week in the NFL. You know, you know we're gonna bounce back. So you can take those things to the bank. Let's head over to the college football game, Amel. And similar to what we did in the NFL, we've got some questions that we need to ask. I'm going to fire this first one off to you. All eyes were on Columbus last week. This was it. You got embarrassed if you're Ohio State by Michigan last year. Um, they finally got the monkey off of their back talking about the Wolverines, and they handed Ohio State a very disappointing loss in Ann Arbor and went on to go be a part of the college football playoff. They went and did everything that Ohio State wanted to do. Fast forward to this year. This game has been circled on the calendar. You get these guys at home. You're going to fix the wrong that happened in 2021. You go out on the field Saturday, and what happens? Michigan beats you even worse than they did last year at their place. So I've got to ask Emil the question. Is Ryan Day a fraud? Well, I'll say it this way. I think you evaluate college coaches way different, especially college coaches at certain programs than you do NFL coaches. I call them tunnel games. The, the best programs, Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama, USC now soon enough with, with Lincoln Riley, they have eight games a year where when they walk through the tunnel, they won. It's just a matter of how they look that day, okay? Mm -hmm. Because they got better players. And and they're going to have better players. So eight of those games, you, you, I'd even say that they had better players on Saturday. Well, you could, but I'm saying, but that the talent is in the same area code with Michigan. You have eight games at those programs where it's just a matter of how you look on Saturday, which is why we care about how teams look in college football because anybody who watches it understands this. The best programs with the best coaches win games usually before they start. Every once in a while, you'll get an upset. So there's three or four games a year where the talent's in the area code of yours, and you've got to actually coach. And, and I got to tell you, he, I know he's 45-5 and five at Ohio State thus far. He was handed a machine by Urban Meyer. It yeah. was a machine when he handed it off. The team that's closest to him in talent has beat the living hell out of him the last two years. Now, yeah, I'm Emil, give I would more. say it's a problem. Yeah, one more year I'll give him. I know people listen to this saying, you, you're saying give a guy one more year if you're 45 and 5. If you're at Ohio State and you can't beat Michigan, that's a problem. What even are you doing? If you what are you doing? Beat, yeah, if you can't beat the team from up north. I get it. I understand. Um, I had this tweet this week because this just struck me. With regards to football performances, whether that's by a player or a coach, wait three days before reacting, wait three weeks before judging, wait three years before summarizing. And I just really that's think people good. need to do that. If you're, 
you know, that first after that first year with Ryan Day, there was some anointing going on. And you know me, I'm a five year coach plan. I've had to reduce it to three years because of, you know, our society and TikTok. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, we're, we're going to find out. We're finding out, let's say, what Ryan Day is really all about. He can't. Let me recruit. ask you this. Let me let me ask you a hypothetical question. And I think it's a fair question because. Most most people would put them on par because of who he coaches. If Ryan Day was at USC this year, he went there this year, same circumstances, mm-hmm. would they be 11-1? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. And, and you made mention of it. He was handed a machine. And what he can do, I will give him credit for this. He continued that machine in terms of recruiting. Oh, he can recruit. There's no doubt. There's been no drop off whatsoever. No question there. He can recruit. He's got, he's got probably the best roster. Maybe George's. I don't know. I'd have to look at it in more detail. That makes things, it actually makes things worse for him, Emil, when you, when you match up the performance with the fact that he's been able to keep that machine rolling. So, um, I don't know if I want to be as harsh as a fraud, but I'm saying that the fraud alert is out there in terms of Ryan. There's not a lot of games, and I'm sure you watch enough Ohio State football because they're on a lot in major games. There's not a lot of games I've watched that I can recall in the last three or four years where he's coached, and I've said, boy, that was really really interesting what he did there. You know, I mean, I I think he he does what a lot of college coaches do because there's very few that can do both. You know, most guys are either – really good XOs developmental or they can recruit. There's a four or five or maybe eight that can do both really well. And they're the upper echelon. I think he's one of those guys. He'll get you the horses. I'm not sure he's going to outfox anybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the jury is definitely out on that. And so we're going to find out just by the way, Emil, I don't know if you saw this come across your ticker or Bleacher Reports hit you with a push notification on this, but it seems Tom Herman is going to be hired by FAU as their new head coach. I saw that. I saw that. Remember, he was anointed a while ago. Yes. And the next great genius. Was knocked <laughs> off of the horse there in Texas. So, yes. We'll see how they, we'll see how it goes down here in South Florida, and especially at FAU where... Let me, let me fire one at you since we're on coaches. Did Auburn make the right choice? with Hugh Freeze? Man, that's going to be a very tough question for me to answer. I did see a very interesting tweet this week. Um, Given Hugh Freeze's past, and despite it, your willingness to hire him, you're telling us that it's really all about winning for you there at Auburn. So if that is the case, why didn't you go all in on a guy like Urban Meyer? If you could, you know, care less about all the other stuff. Oh, <laughs> I thought I felt that that was an interesting tweet. I don't know if they made that play and maybe perhaps they got turned down. I don't know. I I would feel like the Auburn job would be one that Urban Meyer would Listen, take. Did, did you even offer using, that guy the job? Using an analogy, it's trying. It's like trying to figure out who's worse, Jeffrey Dahmer or, or, or Charles Manson. I mean, they're right. Both, oh, man, know, I hate. I, I hate. Both, to, I hate to say that, but yes, it is an analogy. So. I mean, both it's an analogy. Both guys have their, come with a lot of baggage. So to your point, if I'm if I don't care about the baggage, then damn, I'm going to try to get the best coach who has the baggage. Amo, with that being said, I'm going to answer your question with a yes. They did hire the right guy because As we know as opposed to Kiffin. Well, it seems it seems an effort was made in that direction, and for whatever reason, it didn't happen. Whether it was um you know maybe 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 lane was really trying to get some serious guaranteed money and they weren't willing to do I it i think lane's played that smart because if it, to your point we he always we, seems to get a bigger boost out of the place where he is right now but and we exchanged some texts that he can throw in the occasional 10 and 2 season at mississippi and then throw a bunch of eight and fours in there put out a good product where they're competitive and entertaining and generally speaking even though they won't admit this he'll be fine at mississippi I'm he not will. Sure. Yeah, I'm not sure you can do that at Auburn. At Auburn, they expect to compete for and win national championships. And win the Iron Bowl and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think they feel there's a door opening there uh, with Alabama, perhaps moving towards the end of the Saban era. But I would say, yes, they made the right hire because here's what we've got. 
we can speculate and perhaps with pr pretty solid evidence about what went on at Ole Miss while Hugh Freeze was there. Whatever it was that went on, he did win while he was there. Um, <laughs> sometimes I just, when I'm talking about college football, I feel like I'm looking at the bodybuilder up there all muscled up and saying, yeah, he's clean. They're all clean up there. But anyway, they're all clean, sure. Yeah, there are, of course they are. And of course, well, what you're really clean. trying to bounce, what you're trying to get around to say the things that were problems before really won't be problems. They won't be anymore because it's kind of legalized now. So you really can. Pull but they are, through. to your point earlier this week, because what we're seeing now in college football is a fracturing of locker rooms and other situations that are a, a tangential uh yeah not to jump off part. of the question that you asked me but word no, on the street part, you know word on the street from what i've heard from some conversations that i've had with people in the know is that the nil was a big problem in college station and in coral gables this year and it it probably led to some of the um super unremarkable to a yeah. shocking fashion performances so what i'm saying is to your point if you think you're going to bring in a guy who did this before and i'm not saying that's why they did it but and you're just going to bring the guy in say well it doesn't matter now we'll just get the boosters and we'll start getting guys in here that creates a whole other set of circumstances for you that seem to be problematic so i'm not sure what he did before is if he does it's all legalized friend it's all legalized and so if he knows how to do it Go ahead and do it as I drop a little more. You want to hear a great dig my buddy hit me with last week, a big Notre Dame fan. We we laugh. We're good friends. He said, you know what? I have to say, you guys have, have a hell of a team. Congratulations. And getting under the salary cap before game time was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you got to love it. So, you know, based on that, and then I will add this, that Hugh Freeze did take a job. Um, he did go down a level. He did humble up. He went to Liberty and yeah. he went there too. So, um, he's no, a, he's a good coach. I mean, the winning football coach. coach. He's a good football coach. Proving, Let me ask you this. Himself. If I give you one guy in the SEC right now, who 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 deserves to be fired? You know, this would be a really difficult question if Texas A&M was still in the Big 12. But they're not. So I get an easy answer on this, and that is Jimbo Fisher. Um, it's not working there. You know, I'm not a big fire the coach guy, um, but if there's ever a place where, you know, expectations are not being met, it's definitely in college station. Um, and if you look at yeah, that, I mean, how does he fix that? Like, like if you're, if you're sitting there as you're the AD at a and I don't know how you can assess that. I mean, they don't have a talent issue. You can't look at the Texas A&M roster and say, based on the pedigree of these players, we just don't have enough talent to compete. That's that's BS. So, Emil, I would say this: if you're not getting rid of Jimbo Fisher, which it doesn't seem that they are, but sh more shocking things have happened. And again, we are dealing with the great state of Texas where money and oil flows. So we'll wait and see on that. But if you're not going to, I think if you're Jimbo Fisher, you really begin to sit back now and recalibrate your whole NIL structure um, and try to get to the bottom of how that psychologically affects your locker room. I have to think, Amal, we discussed this in the offseason, and I'm gonna we're going to bring it back up again. I would have to think, as a guy who played college football, it would be very difficult for me to accept in my third, fourth, or even fifth year uh, where I had to go through a little something to become the starter for this team and achieve some kind of stardom for a kid 18 years old to be coming in at my position and – he's getting 100 150 250,000 half a million dollars to play college football and i've got nothing or all i've got is the general uh $50,000 for every guy on the team that some booster decided to give it would bother me to have a guy making 10 times what i make listen i i'll go as far as saying this if i was coaching one of these especially these programs that can generally get the talent they need to compete these these top 10 to 15 programs if i had a kid walk in and start talking to me about what i was going to do for him mm. be like this is not the place for you son and i get i, that, I, don't want I that. get that amol and that's happening at a couple places uh, without really naming it people can you know draw their own conclusions that are in position to say that and do that 
But if you're trying to knock those particular schools off, so if you're some other school in the SEC that's not the two teams playing in the championship this week or any of the others that have previously been in the college football playoffs, so I'm really talking about a good four or five teams in that SEC. If you're trying to catch those teams, can you really say that to a player? Me personally, but I'm old school. You're talking to a 50-year-old guy. That's how I'd handle it. I don't care if I'm chasing that team or not. Maybe I'd lose my job over it, but I don't. I don't think you would because I think eventually you'd build a culture that that were to get out there. No, like, but you just but you never know if you're going to get that amount of time because the fan base um, are monsters, and you get ads that would listen to that stuff. And it's not just the fan base. The what the fan base's noise now becomes the media's noise in college football because the media is constantly searching for content. Who do they go to for content? It's the fans that are making noise on Twitter. So now that becomes the question every week. That's what you're facing in the press conference, post game press conference. And now the AD starts to hear, it and the AD starts worrying about the the brand and will people attend games and will we be in position for contracts? And then they start putting pressure on me, the coach. And now, okay. Yeah, I, I know I'm going to be snowball, but I, I just think that I think we're going to get to an era where, sure, you're always going to need some elite talent, but not every kid that walks in the door that's elite feels entitled. But it is more with the kids that were pampered since they were 12, they feel entitled. And I think you're going to see a lot of coaches who are very good at developing, developing players and game plans are going to start looking at the kid that they see as a diamond in the rough, the three star that maybe wasn't coached the best in high school, or maybe they see something that someone else doesn't and they develop that kid. That kid's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, not feeling entitled. You get enough of those kids and a good enough coach, you're going to kick some butt. Sure. Emil, if uh, several thousands of dollars and, and however that structured is going to diminish a player's desire, which most likely it would for kids that age, if that's what's going to happen, then yeah, if I'm a guy that develops talent, I'm going to now have the advantage. If I'm the guy that's getting the player that wishes they would have gotten a hundred or $150,000 coming through the door, but they didn't and someone else did. And now they're determined and I can pull that, you know, desire out of them and turn it into play. Then as a developer, uh, actually being a good coach is now going to, it might come back in. Amo. Well, I, th I think it's always been there. We just, we took our eye off it for a while. Well, you dropped that who would I fire in the SEC question on me. Let me throw this one at you since the Pac-12 is where you lie. Fire someone in the Pac-12 for me. You got to fire somebody. Who are you firing? Oh, I'm firing Justin Wilcox. Are you really? Yeah, he does nothing for me. I mean, I, that guy. He just got the job. <laughs> Listen, okay. They're five and seven or whatever they were this year. And, and I heard I heard those. I don't know who the guys doing the game were the one night they were playing. He's like. This is a good young team. They have potential. I've been hearing that about Cal. Listen, I was sitting up in Boston College in 2014 when he was the defensive coordinator at USC. Boston College ran the ball for 450 yards that night, and they had a quarterback. Okay, you got a better arm than the kid. I think they threw seven passes in the game or something like that. They mm -hmm. ran the same play. I was sitting in an end zone saying, how is this guy the defensive coordinator at USC? I mean, I, I hear you. So, you you know, um, I knew that. I'm he'd, sorry. He'd if his family's listening, I apologize. Maybe he's a nice guy, but no. <laughs> Bye. You giving Jed Fish a pass? Who? Jed Fish. See, that, that's a that's a good Who? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what is going on in Arizona? Well, I mean, listen, Arizona has been a disaster, but they were competitive this year. That quarterback, I mean, that was a nice win. I saw the end of the UCLA game, and they actually have a pretty good offensive football team. The quarterback's not bad. He's got potential. They need some They need some guys on defense. I mean, Chad, they can't stop anybody. Yeah. I mean, I, mean really? I know that's his job to recruit that, but let's be honest. I mean, he is recruiting at a basketball school. I mean – He'd kind of be on my list. So flipping back to the SEC question, I know it was my question. Who would you fire in that? Would you, would you? Would oh, you no, you hit, you hit the nail on the head. I yeah, mean, that was kind of easy too. one there for me. Oh, that was to me. I, for, for the money that man is making. And I mean, even before this year, forget the five and seven, what has Texas A&M really been with him? An eight and four team. They beat, they? Al they beat Alabama. 
That's his. Yeah, good that's one. his. His claim that's to fame national is, championship. Yes. And yeah. he uh and he got after Coach Saban in a press conference. So that's like, you know, yeah, he, he poked it, the bear. He poked the bear there. <laughs> he did, um, and pulled his own pants down in the process. One last question: Staying in the Pac-12. Let's say USC wins that thing this weekend. Should they stay in the Pac-12 and cancel their Big Ten move plans? Well, I told you, I mean, their win has nothing to do with it for me. If the Pac-12 would, I told you this last week, if they would do a few things that they would commit to, I wouldn't mind them staying in the conference. The problem I have with it is I don't think the way the leagues run, I don't think I don't think they see how farcical some of the things they do are like the rest of us sitting out here in reality. So my answer is based on how the league is run. No, as a purist like you, I would prefer they be out there where their natural rivalries are. Hmm. I mean, does that make sense? What I'm trying to say to you, the league is just run so poorly. I suppose. Hmm. And yeah, we've definitely talked um, several times about just how silly things are the Friday night games and the, um, putting the marquee games that are on Saturday super late and cutting out a whole Eastern audience out of it. Um, yeah, there's a lot that's going wrong there. Uh, so I might, uh, you know, I'd agree. It's just, God, I'm cool. surprised Friday night's game isn't starting at 10 o'clock Eastern time. I'm shocked. They're actually going to start at eight o'clock. You know, Friday night would be a time you could probably get away with a late start like that, but yeah, but the problem is you could get away with it for guys like us who would watch it. But there's a lot of people who are more casual of nature, and they at, by 11 o'clock, they're yawning, and they're like, eh, I'm going to bed. I get you. What time is it in Hawaii? I think that's what they base all this on. So <laughs> there you go. All right, that's it for us in terms of our college football questions. Let's slide over right now to our college football picks. Amol, this has not been the stronger part of our handicapping game. But you know what, my friend? It is championship weekend, so we're ready to get after Well, the- last week we had a three and three week. Only you led the way there. You were two and one, and I was one and two. Uh, you had a loss on Clemson, and as many people did. Clemson really, I don't know really- what, Amol, I don't know what happened. They had a 14 nothing lead. They had a 16-7 lead. Next thing I know, I stopped paying attention to the game. I come back, South Carolina's winning the football game. Well, you look at the, you look at the way the week unfolded. Clemson might even be in Ohio State spot right now if they won that game. Waiting for USC to lose tomorrow night to... They had a shot. They had a shot. And it was based on pedigree. Do I really think Clemson... No, no business. No business being in there. No. But anyway, you took a loss there. Boston College made you sweat because they were ahead in that game. Oh, did they try to fall apart? Yeah, they ran into the end. Late nice team. pick. And then you had a great pick on Texas Tech. I know the game went overtime, but they were an, an underdog at home. And uh, Oklahoma just has no business being a road favorite this year. So you were two and one. You're, we're, you know, hopefully with the Bulls, we can get over 500 in college. Like we're killing it in the NFL. College, not so much. You're 16 and 22. You have a push. Uh, me, I took Ohio State foolishly. All the things Chad talked about. I thought Ryan Day circled this game and his team would come out ready to play. I know they have slightly more talent, if not, you know, a, a, a fairly wide gap with Michigan. Not that Michigan's not talented, but I think Ohio State's uber talented. They lost and they got their pants pulled down. Uh, I had a nice win on Oregon State, although when they were down 31-10 midway through the third, I wasn't feeling so good. But uh, Oregon had a complete collapse, and Oregon State got the outright win. So that was a win for me. And then finally, I don't even want to talk. I don't know what I was doing taking Iowa State. I mean, 62-14, I should get two losses for that. So I was 1-2 uh, and two on the week, and I'm 18-21 and 21 in college. All right. Um, I'm going first in the college football game. Amel, this – this, and what what'd you say the record was in college football for you? For me, 18-21. and 21. I am uh, going to make you happy with this one. I'm going to back your USC Trojans. You know how I feel about the rematches, all right? I would have to think USC would be extremely motivated after, you know, what took place earlier this year when this very same – but this is what I hate about, um, you know, not having divisions um, in in college, in, in some of these conferences. You get these rematches, but – 
earlier this year in a game played at Utah. They lost by a point. Amo, they now get this thing on a neutral field. USC has been on a complete and total roll. I'm a little surprised at how low the line is. I have it at two and a half. Do you have it at something yes, else? Yes, that's the same thing. I'll tell you, there's a couple of interesting things. I was going to make this a pick, but I didn't want to jinx them. <laughs> that sounds funny. I understand. Uh, I totally get it. Um, in the first game, Jordan Addison left in the first half. He ended up missing three games after that, so he didn't play the rest of that game. Eric Gentry, their leader on defense, the guy who lines everybody up, a tackling machine, uh, he left in that game. Uh, and Utah's tight end went crazy. Now, flip it around. Those guys are back and healthy. They both sat out three weeks in games. I think USC intentionally sat them out to get them completely healed, games they knew they could win. While Utah's quarterback is a little bit banged up, he hasn't been the running threat he's been for the last couple of weeks, and their tight end, uh, Kincaid, is banged up a little bit. So I think... It favors USC on paper. We'll see if they execute, but I like the pick as far as you're thinking. Sure. The, but again, the line makes, gives me a little bit of a funny feeling, but uh, you know, it's a championship game. So I think there's some reverence to that fact there, but I just think USC is rolling right now. Um, and Utah is a very difficult place to play and to play it, given everything you mentioned to a one point loss just really stands to um Stands to reason that they would win the rematch. Um, so I like USC here. I'll be too. honest. I think, you know, you know, you could laugh at this. I think there's a lot of people, and, and I think the odds makers are building this into lines that USC usually gets overlined. In other words, they get a lot of money. Yeah, they're a marquee so, brand. Yeah. But I think this year, because of last year, there's people that really can't believe what they're watching. Like people who, who follow the sport that bet on it are like, this team was four and eight last year. I watched them play. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And they're they're like, what, you know, what in the hell is going on here? So right. that's the case. Sticking with rematches, we've got one in the Big 12. Um, and again, I'm going to back the team that lost the first one. Kansas State really got after TCU in that first meeting. Uh, they went into halftime with a lead in the game, 28-17, maybe felt – you know, they were feeling themselves, smelling themselves a little bit and decided to do absolutely nothing in the second half. And TCU went on to score 21 and ended up winning the game by 10 points. I think there's going to be some adjustments made based off of what happened in that second half here by Kansas State, who's quietly had a really, really good season as evidenced by them being in the Big 12 championship game. When it comes to stuff like this and having to beat a really good team like that twice, it's a very difficult thing to do. Add to that the pressure TCU has in terms of trying to get into this college football playoff and seal the deal on the season. And I think all the pressure falls on TCU. And the way they've been winning games, Emil, is similar to what you said about the Minnesota Vikings. Can you just continue to win games like that and run everything down to the wire and empty your emotional tank every week? I don't know. They had an easy one last week, but... Um, I think they've got their hands full. The handicapper them. hat in me says everything you're saying. What makes me scared of this game is, for the most part this year, while I, in our preview section of the year, I, I expected TCU to surprise people in the Big 12, but not to this extent. I mean, I was thinking they were 5-7 and seven last year. Maybe they go 8-4, and 9-3. and three. And I haven't been a supporter as, as the season went along thinking they're going to lose somewhere. And every time I say that, they win. So that's the only thing that scares me. But on paper, what you're saying and your logic makes strong sense to me. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to stick to my guns here and roll with the team that lost the first time, especially a team as good as Kansas State. So I'm going to take them two and a half is what I have here as well. Yep. All right. Falling into the SEC. Just can't get enough of SEC football. Emil, did you have in your mind by any chance what you thought this line would be before you saw it? So did you put a line in your head before you saw the actual line for this game? Uh, you know what? I mean, you it sounds like you were surprised. I wasn't. I kind of felt it's in the right. I got 17 and a half right now, and I kind of feel that's the range it would be in, you know, in that 16 to 20 range. I didn't put it there. I put it at nine and a half, ten. Well, I think yeah, the recency I, bias of what happened last week, I think, kind of they they had to compensate with the line sure um and so with that being the case i'm kind of going to roll with the odds makers here and say you know what at 17 and a half yeah you know what they know something here about 
Georgia, and it's I mean, it's not really a secret. They've been a dominant football team for two years right now, and they don't show any signs of slowing down. What I've seen out of LSU is this. They've pulled off some strong performances this year. You know, of course, beating Alabama at home. It took every second off of the clock to do that. Um, you know, is hanging 45 on Florida, which doesn't seem as impressive anymore, given the fact that, you know, Florida State went out and did the same thing, not taking anything away from Florida State. They're probably one of the top five, six teams in the country right now. But LSU has shown that they can completely fall flat on their ass. Um, as evidenced by what happened last week, lost by 15 there. They played Tennessee earlier this year at home and lost by 27 points. So they could absolutely go get blown out by Georgia. And uh, Georgia seems to be on a mission, Emil. This is the new Alabama. It's the new Kings of college football. And I think they're eager to prove it and show it right here in the SEC championship game. I would dare say this is more of a game that they would get up for than their first round matchup in that college football playoff. So at 17 and a half, their chance to really beat the hell out of a team that's not Alabama in the championship and say, we own this conference. It's going to be too much for them not to, to turn down. I think this is going to be a really one-sided affair. Yeah. Great job by LSU and Brian Kelly in his first year, but not, not quite ready yet. Yeah. I'll save us some time. This is one of my picks. So I like Georgia, but recapping Chad's picks, he's got the USC Trojans tomorrow night to win the PAC 12 title, giving two and a half. He's got Kansas state plus two and a half to upset TCU and uh, w win the big 12 title. I still think TCU would make the playoff unless it's embarrassing. And uh, he's got Georgia minus 17 and a half to roll LSU and win the sec title. Uh, and like I said, I'll start quickly and just go, I've got Georgia just like Chad. I don't need to repeat what you said. I Everything you said, just put ditto. I mean, then, I and think, then some, yes. And then some. This is, I think they win big. The other game I'm looking at here, I got Fresno State. I, I want them plus three and a half against Boise. Boise won the first matchup 40 to 20. I happened to follow Fresno a little because they were on USC schedule. We played them early. We knocked their quarterback out in the second week. Good player. We beat, I think it was 45-17. Uh, when he was out then from that point forward, they lost games against uh, UConn. They have a loss to Oregon State when he was in. They lost by three up there, which is a good loss. Oregon State's excellent at home. And then they, they, they lost to Boise. And then this kid came back, and I think they've rolled, they're eight and four. I think they've rolled off seven in a row. They were they were one and four. I they were favored to win this conference when the year started. And if, if this kid did not get knocked out, I think they'd be a 10 and two team. Their losses would have been Oregon State and USC. Uh, I think they win the game by 10 points. Give me Fresno State plus three and a half. Yes. And they have indeed won seven in a row after, you know, the early season turmoil with the quarterback situation, lost four and then and then proceeded to win. Yeah. Seven. And then I'm going to give you a surprise for my last one. I like Purdue plus 16 and a half. Do I think they're going to win the game? Hell no. But they throw the ball around. They've got nothing to lose. They're playing with house money. I think Michigan went into that game last week wanting to make a statement that we're the new bullies of the Big Ten. And they did it. And maybe emptied a little bit of the tank. They're yeah, gonna you think be they're going to be play. fat and happy? Yeah, and they're going to be in the playoff, win or lose. Okay, they're going to be in. Um, now I'm not saying they're going to lose, but 16 and a half is a number. You've got to be motivated. This feels like one of those games, Michigan grinds it out and wins it 30 to 20, 30 to 17. So I, I'm going to take the 16 and a half with Purdue. I think the number's a little heavy for the state of mind that Michigan's in. Yeah. You're not completely out of your mind. I don't remember if I made this a pick last year, but I do remember feeling pretty certain that um, Michigan would cover their number against Iowa last year. I think they were sizable favorites going into that Big Ten championship game, but it was a different deal. It's like Michigan had something to prove there. They needed to finish this thing off, off of the Ohio State win. And with this being the second year that they've knocked off Ohio State, especially doing it at Columbus, there may be a little bit of satisfaction. And like, they may still be full on that thanksgiving turkey yeah, you yeah. and you know what i think the thing i like more about purdue than iowa in that spot last year is iowa's always seems to be an offensively challenged team that yeah so if they get behind they can't do anything about yeah it. purdue throws it around so you know they could fall behind say 21 nothing 
throw up some garbage points, then Michigan will score again. You know, I mean, it could be one of those two. So, I mean, I just think you got such a bloated number that if you're within 20 in the last half of the second, the last half of the fourth quarter, you can get the backdoor cover and, and win the game. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. And so that's where we are. You can summarize all this for us, our resident accountant. What do you got? For uh, I'm, I'm taking Georgia with you, minus 17 and a half. I'm taking Fresno State, plus three and a half. And I'm taking Purdue, plus 16 and a half. Hope you wrote that down, audience there listening and watching. Get all that stuff down. We're going to have a really good championship week. And, of course, we have our NFL picks that we're going to battle back on. I hope you guys enjoyed all of the content that we dropped out here for you today. We answered some very important questions. I'm going to tell you guys once again, if you're actually watching this on YouTube, you can drop some questions as comments on here. Of course, we would certainly accept your comments on anything else. But any questions that you may want us to ask um, and answer on the show next week, feel free to do that. If you want to send those questions in by email, cwilson at gridironstuds.com. Or, of course, you can drop that comment on anywhere on social media where you see us advertise this show. So Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, anywhere that you see the show post it up you can do that but outside of that we really do appreciate you listening and watching the show once again if you're on uh anchor spotify apple Podcasts, anywhere that you're streaming this go ahead and hit the subscribe button so that you are notified the next time we put out a great great show like this one so that's going to wrap it up for us for amo calamino i'm chad wilson thanks for watching and listening to the gridiron stud show